And so I think that that's really part of the healing. Like, let's have whatever your insecurities are, we're all going to have them, but to really create a healthy space and environment. Welcome to Spiritually Hungry. We are so excited to have Jordan Younger with us here today. We've been um, together on podcasts before. We've been guests on yours. And and Mm -hmm. so we're so happy to welcome you on ours. There's so much to talk about. And I was also reading your book, Breaking Vegan. Um, And there are so many, you guys should check it out. There's so (laughs) many similarities that I didn't realize that we had actually, because when we It's interesting. I think the conversations we've had until now have been really about where we are today. And so Mm -hmm. I hadn't really known about your past and mine didn't come up that much either. But something we do have in common, um, I had anorexia and you had orthorexia, Mm -hmm. which a lot of people don't know about. And I kind of discovered that a few years ago. Um, And as I understand it, Dr. Stephen Bratman, Mm -hmm. he coined that in the 1990s, but I didn't discover it till a few years ago. And I'm like, there's so many people I know that have this condition. So basically it's different than anorexia because anorexia is more about, you know, you you don't see yourself as you really are. Mm -hmm. You um, think you're fat when you're, you know, emaciated, among other things. I think some of the similarities is that it's a control issue is what it seems like to me. But orthorexia is kind of an obsession, correct me if I'm wrong, um, with eating healthy foods and only putting healthy things in your body to the point where you could even become malnourished. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Correct. Mm -hmm. So you suffered from both or just orthorexia? Just orthorexia. So we're taking it all the way back. This I wrote this book in 2014. So I was actually living in New York and we were just talking about New York and I said, are are you familiar with the city? And I was living in the West Village going to school and starting my blog and having orthorexia and just going through the whole, going through all the motions. Because you were the blonde vegan, right? At the time. And that was your blog, Mm -hmm. right? And now you're the balanced blonde. So we're going to talk about that transformation. Yeah. Um, When did you realize that it had become a lifestyle, I guess, a vegan lifestyle, a healthy lifestyle Uh to something that was taking a hold over you. Yeah. So I have learned so much in the last 10 years since I wrote this book. And I'm so happy now to be able to look back and talk about it in a different way because I wrote that book and I'm so happy that you have it here today. I haven't had the chance to talk about it with people in forever um, because it's been a while. But I have learned a lot where I was so I was so young. I was 22 mm-hmm. in 2014. I was a new blogger. I had so much popularity, for lack of a better word, because there were not a lot of bloggers back then, especially in food. Mm-hmm. It was a vegan blog. And suddenly, the blonde vegan is no longer vegan. And this broke the internet. And I was on CNN and Good Morning America and Australian news shows like It was such a whirlwind and I had no concept at the time of how that was maybe a little detrimental to become the poster child for orthorexia, which most people didn't know what that was. And to this day, I'm pretty sure if you Google orthorexia, there's a picture of me. Really? I mean, you guys can try and tell me I haven't tried (laughs) in a long time. Looking at the audience, you guys can try. (laughs) And... I don't love that, you know, now. I think at the time I was so caught up in just wanting to speak about what I was going through. And now looking back, I also know I had Lyme disease and was seeking to feel better through food and through what I was putting in my body. When did you have, when did you first... I mean, I guess you don't really know. I was diagnosed with Lyme in 2018, Mm. but I had symptoms starting as a teenager. Mm. So all the way back to probably 2005. Um, So you started to try to find a way to feel better. And that probably led you to become a vegan. So I had been living in this very inflamed body. Exactly. And I found this way of living that was anti-inflammatory and felt amazing and I was making turmeric smoothies and spirulina juices back before that was a thing. 
Now that's a thing. Yeah. Everybody listening is like, yeah, we know what that is. Well, back I think then, Starbucks might even have a turmeric drink <laughs> probably, at this point. But yeah. Back then I was in my 300 square foot apartment in the West Village, putting all these superfood powders into my blender and blogging about it. And then- um, And it was making you feel better. It, for a long time. So for two years, I mean, it felt like a long time when I was 22, for two years, felt incredible, felt healthy and energized, anti-inflammatory. I lost a lot of weight. I was just feeling on top of the world. And then I created a brand around it. And so of course it became the lifestyle and the identity and the brand. And I was so young and I was so caught up. And sometime in mid 2014, I had a friend in New York who came to me and she said, and she was also a blogger, a food blogger. She said, I, I'm, I think I'm anorexic and I think I have orthorexia and Your I friend have said my that. friend uh -huh. about herself. Uh -huh. And she said, I'm, t I'm meeting with this therapist and nutritionist and suddenly I'm just realizing all these things about myself. And just through that conversation with her, I felt like, oh, mm. I might have kind of an obsession here too, especially because I have an obsessive personality. Mm -hmm. So I started meeting with the same therapist and the same nutritionist found out that I probably had orthorexia and immediately started blogging about it and immediately was on the news and then writing a book about it. Let but me it ask was, you, is it because the media, they wanted to say, oh, wait, look, this vegan lifestyle is not healthy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't so much even about ortho. I mean, it was just a way to bash something that was yeah, so I have trending. a lot of thoughts about this because, now, and right. I'm trying to be nice about it the way that I'm speaking, <laughs> but it's like the media yeah. absolutely screwed me. Like it was- You kind of think was, consciously? Uh, well, because that's the story. What's I the sexy story? Was, the, the sexy, sexy story, story is- was veganism almost killed her. Right. That was the headline. Oh, wow. Okay. And so right. I was walking around with a target on my back to the vegans for the last 10 years, veganism almost killed her. And I've always been saying, no, it never, it never almost killed me. I'm a huge proponent of the plant-based lifestyle. I'm just an extreme person. And I'm just sharing, I'm just one person sharing my story. And I was so young and the whole thing got really huge. But now I also know I was, I had an autoimmune condition right. and I was trying to feel better. And yes, I was obsessive. And yes, I think a lot of young women, we turned to food to control. And I had so many things going on in my family. So not only was I feeling better, but this was a sense of control. And I think we've talked about this with food. So there are, there are definitely a lot of overlaps with anorexia. And I mean, I had a little bit of bulimia. There was stuff going on underneath the mm -hmm. surface. Um, well, I read in your book also, there were a few points that stood out to me. You talked about how, um, well, it was interesting. It seemed like whenever you felt pain or out of control, mostly about romantic relationships, the go-to was food mm -hmm. restriction, which I understand that um, whenever I had felt stressed, I'd over-exercise and under-eat, no question. It was like my that was the formula to make me feel better. But we had another similarity in that um, you talk about, it's the cutest way you wrote about it, that you were in your, was it your Gap bathing suit? Oh, yeah. And you were nine, I mm -hmm. think. And um, you were swimming with your cousins because I was that kind of kid. I was like a tomboy out and like swimming all day long. I lived in New Orleans, like with my cousin. And um, so you get out of the pool and you're feeling like all great. You know, you've got your new, sw your new swimsuit on. Yes. And you overhear your mom and your older sister talking. And you'll you hear your old sister say, no, I don't think that she's gained weight. And then you you suddenly realized it was about you and you felt insecure and you started to go listen closer. And then you didn't really feel good about yourself exactly. in that same way. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a story with my older sister um, and it was the beginning and you call it an awareness. Uh, I, I think that's really what it is. It was the first time I actually paused and thought, oh my God, should I be concerned with how I look? It was the first time I saw myself externally as other people see me exactly. or might see me. It hadn't mm -hmm. been a thought before then. Um, but I was with my sister who I adored. She's four and a half years older than I am. And um, I would think I kind of worshiped her, you know, like mm -hmm. she was my older sister and I just thought she was the coolest thing. And she asked me to go to dinner one night and I was like, wow, she wants to be alone with me, go to a restaurant. So we went, um, just the two of us, and I was so elated and Remember we walked home from the restaurant and I was still very tomboyish. I had not gone through puberty yet. I didn't have curves yet. 
So when I got closer to my house, I started to do cartwheels and skip and, you know, as you just yeah, like spring into so joy. Mm -hmm. And then when we got to the front door, I'm waiting for her to come. She has the keys and she's like, oh, I can see it's happening. And I was like, what? And she said, I can see, I, I see the cellulite starting the back of your thighs. Oh, now I can no. tell you today that was impossible because again, mm -hmm. I was like tomboyish, yeah. but then I was, I didn't even know what cellulite was, but I knew I didn't want it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so I went into <laughs> the bathroom and I'm like, what's going on? It was the beginning of a fear for me that had totally. developed. But anyway, that was like, it was interesting to see the commonalities. Yeah, that the it's that crazy. is interesting. You know, it's crazy that par parents, siblings do this. I mean, I, it mm -hmm. still happens today. Oh, I often. Mean, I mean, that's kind of why I wanted to talk about it today too, because yeah. we spend a lot of time mentoring um, young adults and teenagers. And I just, I heard a story um, just two weeks ago about a girl who has gained some weight and her father, I'm sure he does not mean to do this, but he's fat shaming her. Like he makes her get on the scale in front of her siblings and oh. to look. And, you know, I, I sure don't. So mm. No, I mean, I think a lot of parents don't, don't know how to talk about it and don't know how to bring it up. Do you bring it up? I think in our cases, there was nothing to have even brought, brought up. up. I was yeah. not an overweight child. I, and I can remember this so clearly. And because I wrote this book so long ago, you're bringing back a memory that I'm so grateful to talk about. But yeah, I, I can still remember getting out of the swimming pool. And he and my sister is about 20 years older than me. So this is like two adults <sighs> talking. Right. And I just hear her say to my mom, no, I don't, she doesn't look chubby to me. Wow. And I'm looking around, I'm like, who's she? I'm the only <laughs> girl out here. Um, and I just remember thinking, my mom would say that about me. My mom looks at me that way. Like, and I just kind of realized, and I was so young, but something must be wrong or I must have gained some weight. It's just so hard when you're that young because you do not see yourself externally. And I had never had a thought like that in my life. And my mom now doesn't remember having had that I'm conversation. Sure. <laughs> and she she's read the book, of course. Oh, and, uh, yeah. What was her reaction? Um, what was her reaction? Well, she said, I don't remember that at all. And it doesn't sound like something I would do, but I'm sorry. And I mean, she's always willing to apologize and and own what she didn't know at the time. And it doesn't sound like something she would do, but it happened. So I mean, I'm still grateful that my sister said, no, I don't think so. Cause I held on to that. And I'm like, right. I think I pretty much look fine, but it was definitely an awareness. And all of my friends were stick thin and I was just a normal, healthy body, just exactly what you would imagine that to look like. And so I did start to compare myself and think about myself in those ways. It's so interesting, mm -hmm. right? Because of course that wasn't your mother's intention. It probably was her own fear or feelings about how maybe she felt when she was mm -hmm. a kid or how she wants her children to look or what we're all complicated. Mm -hmm. And, and totally. it's usually with not a bad intention, but I think so often, um, you know, we don't, we don't realize the power of our words, our opinions, mm -hmm. especially to the people that we love. Um, so I want to go back to that. So that point where then you decide not to be a vegan anymore. And then did you start to realize that you needed to get help for Lyme? How did, so how did that, how, how did you become healthy then through mm -hmm. that process? Yeah, it was a journey. So 2014, I started seeing the therapist in New York. And that was a complicated time too, because I actually look back to those conversations with that therapist and it was not a good situation. Mm -hmm. I think I was being fed a lot of projected information about what she thought I was going through, projected information about my family. And it was so confusing. And I had been in therapy since I was five. So it wasn't the wow. first interaction with a the therapist. Why but so it was early. Um, so when I was five, my parents were worried because I was just pretty obsessive. So they thought maybe does she have OCD or does she have I mean, like a sensory disorder, which back then I don't think there was a word for that, but I wanted to wear my clothes inside out and I was sensitive to everything, sensitive to sound and to light. And um, that's so interesting. They had never met a person like this or had a child like this. And they were concerned. Um, the therapist said she's totally normal. Uh -huh. She has a lot of emotions. She feels comfortable to express them to you. This is really positive. And 
thankfully that was that was a, a good, good one yes <laughs> and she was a therapist that I saw kind of off and on all until after high school yeah so I got help for the orthorexia through various ways like therapy nutritionist I moved back to LA and I started seeing a functional medicine doctor also way early in terms of functional medicine everybody has a functional medicine right. doctor right. now back then it was amazing that there's a doctor who's willing to do blood work and test your stool and talk about parasites and gut dysbiosis and candida. Mm -hmm. And I had all of it. Mm -hmm. And so it really helped me to see. Wow. I, I was not healthy, even though I looked healthy and all these things. And I was just trying to feel better through food. And I just gave myself a lot of grace. I wasn't trying to deprive myself. I wasn't trying to cut out all the foods that are not like perfectly clean vegan, but that's what happened. And I think just giving yourself forgiveness. I don't know if you feel this way about your journey. I have so much compassion for the younger version of oh, myself I see that too. because she was really so hard doing on the best yeah. she could. I'm so happy that I discovered a way of life that I had thought was working at the time and it was. I just took it too far for too long. I think maybe sometimes it's positive to do a vegan cleanse or like these smoothie cleanses, especially if you have candida and all the stuff that I had. Um, but you don't have to live that way for years. It's it's meant to be a cleanse or a time, mm -hmm. which maybe cleanse isn't the best word to use, but well, detoxing. Think, yeah. And I understand the cleanse, it's like you need to take a I think it's healthy for all of us to take a break from lifestyle in general, right? Too much stress, too much sugar, even too much of mm -hmm. it, right? So I think that the, to take little moments in time where you step away from what your normal thing is. And of course, we're on, people are on different spectrums, right? Some people eat relatively clean. And so maybe they don't need as many detoxes or they don't need to go on them for so long. But I think it really, I mean, gut health, people don't, the gut is the first brain mm -hmm. and people don't, I mean, they're talking more about it now, but I don't think many realize the importance of that, you know, allowing your body to have time to rest between digesting and exactly. not to eat too close to bedtime. Like those very basic, right? That's not even like, but I think many times we just don't follow that. Um, but if I can, if we can just go a little bit back, because every when we do a podcast, Monica, I often like to underscore things that I think are so important. Yeah. And this, the, the conversation we're having about, you know, both of your experiences as children, and I'm thinking, you know, I know now you're pregnant with your second child. And, and as we think about our kids as, as they were growing up and as they continue to grow up, I think it's such an important message for parents and siblings, but for parents that, that, you know, one word right? Can, can have impact both positive, mm -hmm. but unfortunately negative for the rest of that, of that child's life. Absolutely. And I don't think, you know, I don't think there's, there's definitely not enough awareness around enough parents about that. We've talked about on our podcast about conscious parenting. And I, it's one of the topics I wanted to actually talk to you about is um, spirituality. And, and if you have a spiritual practice and how you bring that into parenting, or even with your husband, who is lovely, we've met him, but um, as a couple. And I think that, you know, when I, um, the only kind of residue really with anorexia for me is body dysmorphia. So if I look in the mirror, I'm, I really often can't see what I accurately look like. If I really care, like if I'm wearing a dress to a wedding, I might take a picture in the mirror and then I'll look at the picture and I can see the picture. Oh, interesting. So it's just like those kinds of, you know, it's the residue, it's what's left over. But I was mm -hmm. very aware um, and once I discovered this too, and I didn't know that when I had it, but that it's genetic, there is a gene. And when I discovered that, I was like, oh, I went back through like we all the women in my with, family. With, with her grandmother. And, and my mother, aunt and, and my aunt. mother. And I, I just, What's the gene? I, I wonder if I have it. Well, if, so I, it's just, it also is something that needs to, um, just because a person has it doesn't mean it's going to be awakened, right? Mm. So it also has to do with environment. It has to do with, dynamics in the household, especially relationships with usually mother, daughter, mm -hmm. or seeing it between the parents, also outside peer pressure. For me, it was like the perfect storm of all of it, mm -hmm. you know, like totally. at every single angle. And I was insecure, you mm -hmm. know, so, so with my daughters, but even sons, because we don't talk about this enough with men. I mean, mm -hmm. I know somebody who has orthorexia, he's a man. And mm -hmm. it's just like, that's when I I discovered it was 10 years ago yeah, because I was wow. watching his eating. I was like, he's not anorexic, but what is this? Because 
the obsession about like only certain foods. And so then I started to do my research. That's how I discovered it. Oh, wow. Um, Cause I'm just super curious anyway, but with my daughters, especially I'm just, I've been very open about my process, but I also very consciously made sure that I was healthy around them always. And that dessert is not a sin. And mm-hmm. that if you're going to eat it, you know, put it in front of you. It's okay. You don't yeah, have to put it like three exactly. plates to the right and take little nipples. <laughs> yeah, this is something that's that's funny. Funny. Somebody it's else very is. funny yeah. having having <laughs> having dessert because when we go out to dinner with her family, nobody nobody orders. You know my dessert. family listens to our podcast. <laughs> oh, really? I'm okay. just saying, no, no, go ahead. No, I love spending time with your family. That's all I have to say. That's all I have to say. No, no, go ahead. No, it's just very funny to see the way because again, we you know, I grew up in a completely different way. You know, probably not eating healthy, but there was mm-hmm. no sort of yeah. Uh, well, I was mortified when we got married. I was like, you know, this was made 20 years ago, and there are so many preservatives in this that you can yeah. still eat it now. You have to stop eating these things, right? But yeah. still, but still, everybody ate whatever they wanted, and there was never any worry or shame or mm-hmm. even conversation about it. And and every once in a while, we go to dinner with Monica's family. No, first of all, nobody wants to order dinner uh, uh, dessert. Eventually, a few get ordered somehow, and everybody's pushing it to the other person, even though they also want it. Exactly. It's a very oh, interesting yeah. dynamic. Like, this is so good. You take it. <laughs> yes. I have seen. Yeah, I definitely am um, familiar. Yeah, but even, you know, and, and especially I've tried to have a very open and continue open conversations with my children about anything so that mm-hmm. there's never any shame. I want them to feel comfortable to tell me anything, even the things that they're most embarrassed about. And so I think that that's really part of the healing. Like, let's have whatever your insecurities are, we're all going to have them, but to really create a healthy space and environment. Mm -hmm. Do you see any of your old tendencies even come up just as being a mom now? Like the obsessions with things or? It's interesting. I mean, I think it's so different having a boy and then having a girl. And I'm going to be looking to you guys for inspiration. Absolutely. Because I always knew from a young age that I was going to have a boy first. Mm. I was five years old and I felt this connection to a future, his son, and probably also a future daughter. But now knowing that I'm having a daughter, I have a lot more fears. And I think it's because I know what it's like to grow up as a little girl and the dynamics between mothers and daughters and girls and their friends. And I have so much more personal fear. Whereas with Atticus, my son, he's just, he's just, he's just such a ball of joy. I've actually never met such a happy human (laughs) and he's a toddler. So of course he should be, but this is also his personality. This is his aura, his essence. I'm not really worried about him in terms of, I see there was like an older kid at the playground who ripped Atticus's basketball away and was really mean about it. And I was so mad. I was like, like, I'm going to go up to this kid. Like, that is not nice. You do not treat a baby. He's a toddler. Anyways, I... I let it go, but Did Atticus you? just <laughs> kept like, oh my when God. I, when you like, give them the I would let it go. I know, I become yeah. a lioness when people <laughs> yeah. are like, I mean, my I cubs. think I would have said more, but I was like, oh, <laughs> I don't know, I'm just not going to. Um, but I liked seeing his reaction. And also, maybe it's his age, but he was, it just didn't phase him. And I was so happy because it would have phased me. And mm-hmm. I know a lot of kids who would have instantly been crying, and I would have been one of those kids. Um, so I think with him, I don't have a lot of stuff coming up around myself as a child, if that makes sense, Mm -hmm. Um, yet. He's only two and not even two and a half, so we'll see. Um, I do think with a daughter, it's going to be different. And I'm trying to mentally prepare, emotionally prepare, because like you said, I want them to come to me with anything and have conversations that I didn't have growing up. And my parents were amazing and we're so close to this day, but so many things were not talked about. My dad was volatile. He was a yeller. We're Mine not, too. Oh, it's yeah. big time. Yeah, I think it's, it's a good person, uh, but he just the, put in, yes. <laughs> control elements later in life. That's interesting. Um, and he still does. And now I told Atticus, my son, to tell my, my dad yesterday, you're not allowed to yell at mommy. Oh, he, like, still, he still does? Yes. Um, he's He has a horrible temper. He's almost 80 and he's calmed down, but but he's oh God, so loving. He's still yelling. Just, he must have been um, like a real, oh you know, he's older God. now and he's still, yeah. You should have seen him. And he had me when he was 44 
he had my sister when he was 17. Oh. So oh, wow. what I hear is that he was 17. much worse wow. at a young, I mean, look, he's amazing. And any of my followers <laughs> who are listening, he's a wonderful dad with a horrible temper. And it's just, I said that my it. father passed mm-hmm. almost three years ago. And I always say he was like an amazing, he taught me love, like beautiful person, but he just couldn't handle stress at all. Exactly. And when he felt stressed, he just, this is that's what came out. And I think just generally, generationally, but we have so much information and we have so much at our fingertips in terms of access to tools and meditation. Like I think in their time, it was just like, be successful, provide for your family. There wasn't a lot of time for this kind of but, conversation. But I, exactly. but I think it's an important point and again, and we do speak about this, but that parents love their kids, right? And there's no, I'm sure your dad definitely loved you. And when, but they, we're not always aware that how we behave, forget it, we spoke before about certain things that we should not say to our kids, but just the way we behave, the energy we have in the house has a long-term impact mm-hmm. on our children and their happiness and their lives. So I hope is that any, any parent listening and, and who has, you know, whether because of stress, you know, really says, well, I really love my kids. So even though maybe my natural reaction to one thing or another might be to yell, to raise my voice, but but how much you, you don't you love your kids more than than that reactive behavior, mm-hmm. and to really understand that it actually does have a long term effect, and you know and that's why when we try we, with our kids from when they're younger and even till now, when you're around them, you want the environment in the house, you want the energy in the house to be a calm one, to be a happy one, and I, again I don't think there's enough aware enough awareness amongst mo- enough parents about how much our behavior, not oh, even our yeah. direct interaction with our children, but our behavior in the home has a direct impact, not only in on their lives now, but for the rest of their lives. It does. It does. And I've tried to share that with my dad. He kind of gets it. So he tries to understand. Funny, we were talking about human design a little while ago. My dad's a reflector and I'm a reflector. And the, that's the 1% of the population. So we are that's mirrors funny. to each other. Mm-hmm. And we butt heads. We're very similar and we're very different. And I'm very confronting to him because every fear he's ever had about finances and stress. I'm the opposite way. And he just can't handle it. Um, but he loves he wants it. You to, he wants um, you to stress? or He wishes probably that I would stress more because it's just- He thinks you'll take it like seriously It's the only then, thing but. he knows how to do, really. Like, Sorry. But he's also the person who could have more money than anyone and say that he has nothing. So, I mean, it's like we could do a whole analysis. Yes. It's a whole thing. <laughs> um, I spoke to him and many times and I've done everything to try to heal um, from the inside out, from meditation to plant medicine ceremonies to spirituality, faith, everything. And in plant medicine specifically, I have had these major downloads of ancestral remembrances and my paternal lineage coming through me and showing me oh, this is so real. And we know it's real and we're talking about Mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. It lives in our DNA. And I've been on journeys in that setting with my dad's parents and they've passed many years ago and how they've shown me how all of my dad's children carry traits that come from long, long, long ago. And they come out differently in all of us. And when I really think about it and I reflect That behavior at home when I was a kid, it influenced everything. And I would love to know who I would be if if they're just just interestingly, because I think nothing happens. Um, There's no mistakes and no coincidences that I chose this life. I chose him as my father, and I think he's been my father in many, many lives. But I would love to know who I would be without all that. And I've told him, like, this is why I have issues. And he's like, I know. I mean, he doesn't oh, he really deny it. it. He it. That's interesting. He, mm-hmm. Well, what's your relationship with your mother? We're very close. We're best friends, close as can be. There's definitely some stuff that has come up around. She's a very reserved person. And I never really felt that she stuck up for me or herself as much as I wish. And she knows that. Actually, I think she does a lot more now. 
but I'm 33 now. So I mean, that whole childhood, I think it would have been nice to see her really say to him, no, like in front of me. But she tells me that she did behind closed doors. And she had this whole idea of parenthood that should like, you should align with your spouse, especially in, in front, front of your child. And that was like all the parenting books that she had ever read. So she was doing the best that she could. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I often look back at the different things that shaped me. And I remember years ago, I just came to the conclusion that it's no disrespect to my parents or, or any, I guess, process that I went through as being their child. But sometimes your parents teach you what not to be. So I felt like seeing certain behaviors, actually, I made a choice at a very young age that I made a note of this. I know how I feel. It's not great. And I'm, this is not going to be part of my future. Mm -hmm. So I chose a man, for instance, that would never yell, like, yes. ever, uh, you know, um, where I was safe to tell anything to without any shame whatsoever. Um, just the different things that were painful for me. I think I made a very conscious choice about who I wanted to marry and and also more importantly, perhaps who I wanted to be in the marriage, mm -hmm. you know, the different style of like the roles, you know, of mm -hmm. what a woman should be in the house and what a man should be in the house. I didn't buy into that either. Totally. Yeah. I was gonna, do you think you, your choice of husband was influenced? I just want to say you, like you yeah. are super 100%. calm, like your energy, whenever I'm around you, I just feel just like Zen. And I, and you were saying, I wonder who I would be, if if your father, you know, if my father, what, but I actually think that this this is who you are because of yeah. That. So that's I such think a good that's, way to look that's at how it. I, that's mm -hmm. why I'm sharing my story because I feel like I don't know if you're aware of that, but I think that you somewhere made a decision long ago mm -hmm. that you were going to present yourself and live very differently than your father Absolutely. did. So I I wouldn't say who would I be if not. I'd be like, well, this is you know, mm -hmm. yeah, just my take. I love that way of looking at it, and it's true. I did decide that I'm going to be so different than him. I remember being 11 years old, looking in the mirror to myself, talking to myself, calling in myself at an older age. I was always doing these spiritually minded things, <laughs> didn't know what I was doing, saying, come protect me, older self, and just tell me how different I'm going to be from him because I'm never going to yell at my kids. I'm never going to live in a home with a husband who yells I'm just never going to make these choices. And even my mom, seeing her pretty much go silent in compared to whenever he would yell, that's why I always stood up for myself. And my dad says, I'm the youngest of four kids. I was the first kid and the only kid who wasn't afraid of him. And he did not know what to do. And mm. it's funny to talk to him now because he's like, yeah, I think looking back, it's funny because you were always right. Everything you said was always right. And he just couldn't express it in the moment because I was like a five-year-old telling him, you're crazy. You've lost your temper. <laughs> like you're not even making sense. And then it would prompt him to think, oh my God, she's right. But I can't show that. Um, so you probably had to come yeah. with more force. So I was just, I was always defending myself to him. And yeah, and then I chose a partner who is incredibly calm. You guys have met Jonathan. Yeah. And I mean, he's- He seems funny uh, too. He's and hilarious. Like and, and he's, he doesn't yell. I mean, after we had kids and we got a little sleep deprived and things were crazy, <laughs> he yelled for the first time a couple of times, but he knows now, sorry, but that activates something in my nervous system that you just can't do with me. It's very dangerous for me. And I still have a lot of work to do around it, but it's not, we can't, yell. we can't yell. We can't show our kids yelling. So important to me. Um, and he received that. Yeah. He, but they're he like, totally understands. Yeah. We talk about this a lot. This is, an, this is an example of emotional intelligence. You've given him part of your history and your mm -hmm. past. And then when he showed you a part of him now, you're like, wait a second. It's not about you yelling today. But when you do this, this takes me back to my five-year-old self. Exactly. And I'm like fight or flight. And this is just not good for our family. And our. I mean, we had that in our marriage too early on. Um, things that wouldn't make sense were not such a big deal. And I was like, what? You know, it was not yes. about what he did in that moment. It was about where it took me to. I mean, there were a few triggers, but 
Um, I remember when he started to say things like, oh, you know, you should have done blah, 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 or you, you really should, or you could have. And I was like, I'm not leaving. I'm not going to listen to anything. It's like, that, cause yeah. my father was, it was all, and that's part of the shame, right? You should have done this, should have done that. But then of course, when I explained to him why that just shuts me down and um, I will never listen, mm. <laughs> then, you know, because he's a, a thoughtful person and we're about transformation and change, then obviously he, he met me with that. Yeah. Mm. And something you said, it also reminded me of something we, like, we, we try to do in our, at our home is that, you know, certainly in the previous generation, there was this idea of, you know, you have to be strong for your kids. You don't apologize. And I remember a few times, and it's been very powerful for me with our kids, where it wasn't, you know, whether we say something or behave in a certain way, where, and then they come to us and say, you know, this hurt me in this way, or, you know, you raise your voice, and I don't think you should have. And, and it's not always easy, but I'm always happy after apologizing for something mm -hmm. I shouldn't have done or mm -hmm. something that I should have done differently. And again, I think, you know, as we talk to, to, to our listeners, to our to parents out there, of course, doesn't mean you apologize all the time. And of course, often, hopefully you'll be right and the child will be wrong. But when it's the right time, I think it brings a tremendous amount of both closeness and, and respect. When kids see, when your kids see that when you, you think you did something wrong or behaved in a way that you shouldn't have towards them, you're willing to apologize. It doesn't make it doesn't make you look weak. It actually makes you look much stronger to them. It does. Well, yeah, it's the only brave time we... to apologize. It's hard. It's a hard thing to do, especially for parents to children. And I can count on one hand the times that my dad has apologized to me, and they've all been within recent years because he finally gets it. And I, I had this one little um, Instagram story go kind of viral because <laughs> this was a couple months ago. We had gotten into a bit of a um, argument, big argument, because my son, he spends a lot of time with my parents. They, they live for him. He lives for them. It's such they a special- They live down in LA? They live down here? They split their time. Oh. So they're here half the time, if not more. And they live in our building when they're here. Oh, wow. So he gets to go up there and spend so much time That's with nice them. Though. And it's the best. Um, and I am very, 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 very intense about not using chemical cleaning products. Um, I'm all non-toxic. I've had so many health issues. We're in Mary Ruth's home. Like she's <laughs> like this as well. Like that's kind of how I am. Um, and my dad, they've, my parents have pretty much transitioned to mostly natural products, but he had this just the worst like old school Dawn in his, uh, in the kitchen. And I saw that he was cleaning all of my son's um, plates and bowls and uh, spoons with it. And I was like, what are you doing? And I, at first I try to stay calm. I know how to communicate with my dad to get a good result. And he immediately loses loses his temper and he's like, this is my house and I want to do things the way that I do it. And if you want our help and they're so helpful to us, like we're going to do it our way and oh. blah, blah, I would never do anything that would be bad for his health. And look how great we all turned out. We've been using this forever. I'm like, <laughs> oh my God. So I absolutely lost it. I'm pregnant. I had a hormonal breakdown. I was just like, I'm taking my son. We're leaving or not. We're going downstairs. I'm not talking to you, looking at you. You yelled at me in front of my child, like this whole thing. And a few hours later, my dad <laughs> texted me an apology. I think it's easier for him to text than to maybe say it out loud. And it was this whole, I'm very sorry. I never should have done that. I threw away the dawn, um, <laughs> which for him is a huge deal. And um, would never do anything to hurt Atticus's health. And I'm very sorry. It was very wrong of me to lose my temper. And I love you. And um, it was so shocking. I posted it to my story <laughs> and everyone was dying over like, by the way, I threw away the dawn. Um, cause it was just <laughs> such a cute, funny little thing. And I appreciated it. I mean, nobody's perfect. Maybe the way that I'm being so open makes him sound extra crazy, but it's just like real life dynamics. For sure. Mm -hmm. No, a thousand percent. Did you mm -hmm. speak? Did he speak an apology afterwards? Or yes, did, did, I did made him. him. I mean, <laughs> I'm pretty stern with him. I kind of treat him like I'm in control. Um, <laughs> I always have been that way my whole life. So I did. I said, thank you for apologizing. And you do have to say it to my face. And I need to know this isn't going to happen again. And Especially in front of yours. Yeah. And I'm not just, I'm not just being 
you know, a brat about the products. Like these are not something I believe in. This is not something that my child uses. This is not good for our health. I have had health issues my whole life. I'm doing things very, very differently. And he's like, I know, I know. That whole thing, he totally retracted. So (laughs) So you've recovered from Lyme. Uh, I believe I have. I haven't done any recent lab work on purpose because I found just kind of knowing that I do have it really influenced the way that I felt every day. Mm. And I feel really good. Mm -hmm. I feel healthy. I've had two healthy pregnancies, which I was told I would never have. Really? Because Mm -hmm. of the... Right. They said you Mm -hmm. might, God forbid, be infertile, Mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Wow. And there's a whole thing about passing Lyme to children and you shouldn't have kids, quote unquote. It's a very controversial topic. Um, So to really heal as much as possible before you get pregnant, which I did do. And yeah, my son is so healthy and has no issues. It reminds me, have you heard of Dr. Ellen Langer? I don't think so. so. She's called, uh, she's been a a professor at at Harvard for the past 50 years studying mindfulness. And she's Mm -hmm. called the mother of mindfulness. Oh, wow. And so- Talks about body, mind, unity, not just connection, but unity. And um, it's exactly the point you're making in that whatever you think you yes. are. Yeah. And it's, I believe it. And, the, and for instance, because it's interesting you said about the Lyme disease and not wanting to do the test. She uses an example of people um, who are told by the doctors that they're pre-diabetic. Mm-hmm. And I forget the exact measurement, whatever it is, let's say it's a 0. 0.7. And b- above it, you, a person is told by the doctor they're pre-diabetic. They could be literally marginally below that line and they're told that she they're healthy. She does a whole thing with like, what's the difference with one number, right? So 69 mm-hmm. years old, but then 70 years Like she does this with a lot and she ha- does experiments to follow up, to make her point with this, that mm-hmm. what's really the number. So if you're one below or you're one above, but go ahead. Yeah, but, is- but the mm-hmm. crazy thing is, and this is science scientifically proven according to our studies that the people who were told that they were pre-diabetic developed diabetes at a rate, I forget the number, maybe like seven, 70% of those people developed diabetes. Yes. The people who were right below the line, which means they were basically at the same place where those other people were, did not, they developed maybe 10% of them developed diabetes. And that idea that, that how we think, so we are, but, in, and she, and this is really her her life's work, but Study after study after study, the idea that that how we think about ourselves influences and our health influences it much, much more than than medication. Absolutely. Or- I'm such a huge, huge believer because I knew when I was diagnosed with Lyme and I was so sick at that time and I was so grateful to have a diagnosis and a doctor who understood and could help, but I felt awful all the time. And then I did years of healing from 2018 onward. And everything, everything one could try from Lyme, from supplements, IVs, antibiotics, ozone, stem cell wow. therapy, hyperbaric chamber therapy, wow. plant medicine retreats, working on the spiritual. I went to Bali for a whole summer, like working with healers. I did so much. And I call myself a human guinea pig. And I also enjoy that kind of stuff. So, I mean, I like wellness. I like that kind of I enjoy stuff. most of everything you said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I did water fasting, which I don't recommend. You know, water, for only water for how weeks long? on end. How long? Um, for how many weeks? For three weeks. Wow. With, with doctors at a medical facility. I did that four times. Really? I, I was covered in hives head to toe. From that? Before. Before that. And that took it away. Um, I basically researched anything and everything. Well, you said you wouldn't recommend that. Why? I wouldn't well, recommend I mean, I it think to of most reasons, people. But... <laughs> um, <laughs> well, okay, especially because of what we've been discussing earlier on. I always kind of make that disclaimer. Um, I recommend it to people who need it. It can shrink tumors. There's incredible research. There's people who are blind who could see again. Really? People who couldn't walk who could walk again. It's very helpful for diabetes for cancer or for Lyme, but it just has to be the right person. And I think people know if you're, if, if you're willing to try anything and you can barely live your life because you're so sick, then it's worth it. Um, I just don't recommend it to the average person who's trying to biohack a little bit more health. I think there's way other things to do. And yeah, so I knew that I should be feeling healthier after all these years and I didn't. And then I finally just worked on the mindset mm. element. And that's hard to do because I still, I have hard days. I have 
days where I have no energy and I feel like a sick person and I call myself a sick person and I get a whole backed in, sucked into the cycle. Um, but most days I remain really positive and I have mantras. I tell myself I'm a healthy person mm -hmm. and I have energy and I have healthy children and I live a healthy life. And that is, I believe, how to live a healthy life. Well, is that why you're, I guess that's the balance in the blonde, right? Mm -hmm. That is. So how do you maintain, what does balance look like to you in terms of body, mind, and spirit? Are you, and by the way, are you still, um, are you an intuitive eater now? Or is, is there, because it's interesting, you know, I always teach my children and, and our students, like, don't get stuck on labels. When you label yourself as something and you look at all the things that go under that title, you need to be all of those things, mm -hmm, right? And then totally. that be good or bad. I mean, even when I had anorexia, I didn't even want to call it that. I was just like, there is dis-ease in my body, not a disease, exactly. but dis-ease. And I need to figure out what that balance is basically. But even I remember when I was um, a vegetarian most of my life. And then I wasn't, or I was a marathon runner for most of my life. And then I decided I wanted to start dancing because running didn't feel as good anymore. I was like, well, if I'm not that thing that, you know, you say you're a marathoner right away, you think, oh, well, she's disciplined. She's athletic. That's respectful. Like, but so if I'm not that, then what am I? Right. So yeah. we can get stuck in that kind of thing. So how do you find balance then? Well, first of all, I was a marathon runner too. Really? We have so much in common. That's so funny. And my husband still, he does Ironman. Wow. I don't know if we told you guys that, but no. he's like disciplined, um, but he just does it for fun. Yeah. So, it should be that way well, by the totally. way now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I, yeah, I eat intuitively. So after the whole breaking vegan and the healing, I actually became vegan again a few years after I wrote that book. Mm -hmm. And I really claimed that title again. And Part of it was because I had so much hate from the vegan community wow. and I really, it was so co confusing because I had such a public image as a vegan, non-vegan. I was just showing everybody, no, look at me. I'm plant-based. I have all, I look at my recipes. Like it was a whole thing, um, but I felt amazing. And that actually helped me do a lot of healing from Lyme was this salt, oil, sugar free vegan diet. So um, post water fast. Uh -huh. I did that for many years and developed recipe books and specifically for people who are healing from chronic illness. And then when I was pregnant with Atticus, I started craving meat. Mm -hmm. And I knew from the whole journey that I had been on, the spiritual awakening I had been on, I have to listen to mm -hmm. my body. And it's hard because I love I do love a lot of what the plant-based world stands for, but I more love taking care of my body and giving my body what it needs. So now, yeah, there's pretty much nothing that I don't eat. Um, always healthy, always grass-fed, organic. I'm an Erewhon girl, but I do eat. I know I eat everything. It's funny because mm -hmm. I, with my first child, um, my first is a boy also, and I was vegetarian up until that point. Um, and I only started eating, uh, fish because the doctors at that time I was anorexic. They're like your heart, you need to have some fat oils. I mean, there's other ways to do it, but I was anyway, but when I had David, I was like, I, I need to have steak once a week. Absolutely mm -hmm. must have it. And I did, I respected that too. Mm -hmm. And I felt that that was, you know, I'm, I'm an intuitive eater either. I also, I think that that is the best way to be. Of course you have to be, which is Probably, I think we've kept you a long time, but I want to ask you one more question and it leads into that, um, intuitive eating. So that, that works if you're in touch with your body, mind, and spirit, and mm -hmm. you allow them to speak to one another. So you have shared, I believe that you have psychic and intuitive mm -hmm. abilities. Did you always have those and how did you develop them? Mm -hmm. So I always did, but I turned them off at a very young age because I <laughs> wasn't really in a household where people believed that that was true. And I was relieved when they told me none of that is true. Mm. You, not... you actually had a conversation with your parents? Well, like, I, did you see looking spirits back, or... I understand now. At the time, I didn't understand. I saw spirits. You did. I saw angels. Mm -hmm. I saw ghosts. I saw bad energies, good energies. I could kind of see the future in some ways. And my parents really told me 
there's no such thing as ghosts. And I promise, because I would like sit them down. I was obsessive. So I'm like, mate, dude, you have to promise there's no such thing oh, as ghosts. Because I just want to hug you at five years old. Yeah. That little cute thing. Just like, oh, yeah, listen there's to like me. really dark energy <laughs> in the corner of my room. Like maybe even lived here before we lived here. There's something going on. And they had told me, no, 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 it's not real. And that was at the time, it was fine. It was good for me to hear that because I was able to move on, have a normal childhood, really let a lot of those fears go. And then when it reawakened, it was in my 20s and kind of during the whole Lyme journey, because that took me on such a journey to realize I've been suppressing this spiritual part of myself for my whole life. And even though as a teenager, I loved yoga and I loved being in the yoga communities, because I really felt like this is such a beautiful spiritual way to live. They're talking about compassion and Buddhism. And I really aligned with that. And then I later realized why, because I am this spiritual being having a human experience (laughs) and I'm obsessed with all this kind of stuff and it's amazing. And then I was probably about 25 when I reawakened the psychic abilities. And that's been just a very incredible journey that has also helped me heal. And it's another reason why I don't really look at the blood work for Lyme. I look at how I feel, how my higher self tells me what my purpose is, that I'm here. I think I'm always going to be living a sensitive body, living in a sensitive body, managing what that looks like. And that's okay. So psychic, um, does it come, do the messages come to you in dreams or do you have visions Or is there some kind of practice you do Mm -hmm. to connect to that? So I have a practice and it's taken me a while to hone in on it because I'm a very fly by the seat of my pants kind of person. So I used to just kind of- You're a Sag, right? Well, my son's a Sag. I'm a Libra. Libra. Um, I'm very Libra. And (laughs) with an Aquarius rising, Cancer moon, and um, feeling everything. And I use Cancer too. Yeah, I remember that. So I used to just- hear hear things kind of from people who have passed on and it would come to me out of my control and I thought it was very cool but it it was hard to control um yeah usually it was like a message for someone who I was with or someone that I was close to and then I developed a practice where I channel from I call it the fifth dimension so it's like fifth dimensional consciousness, the angelic realm. Sometimes it's people who have passed on. Sometimes it's these star beings. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of who I talk to all the time. And then the Akashic records. So, and then you ask them specific questions or you ask them if they have a message? I just kind of open the channel and it just comes through. So I'm a very verbal channel. So I'll sit and open the channel with them, do a little prayer, and then just ask them, what do you have to say? And I film it because it's not yeah. something that I can really write down or anything. It's I used to write it down, but then I realized that it's hard because it's taking you in and out. And right. I just like to be in. Um, so you repeat whatever you're hearing out loud and that's what's Exactly. Mm-hmm. They kind of speak through me. And a lot of times I just film it for myself, but I also film it for my community because they love it. That's that's something that they've seen the evolution. I've been blogging for 12 years. So there was the blonde vegan all the way to channeling fifth dimensional consciousness. Mm -hmm. Do you want to um, go deeper with that? Do you have plans for to sit with people want to like put more energy in that way? Or is that too much? Is it, if you're a real empath, Mm -hmm. you are, um, you have to really learn. I mean, I, I can relate in that way. I had to learn to be able to feel people, but not to take in the energy. But if you're, this is a whole different level because if you're actually getting profound messages from their spirit angels or their ancestors, um, that's a lot of energy coming through you. Yeah. So I used to have goals of being a one-on-one channel. Some of my biggest inspirations in this life, that's what they do. Um, and then I realized based off of my personality, my human design, my energy makeup. That's not really what I'm here for. (laughs) Um, I could do it. I might even love it, but it might be very depleting and I don't see myself doing that long term. So I try to do it in more of a large scale way. So I have a platform, it's a meditation platform, but it's also a channeling membership type of thing. 
where people can join. And I'm more so channel for the collective of the group. And people have the chance to ask me questions. So sometimes it's a personal question. Sometimes it's more of a collective question. And I get to channel individually that way. And I think that fulfills that part of me. Mm. Um, And I'm always looking to grow and, and to do more of that. Because what I've found in my healing is that when I don't do that and when I turn that off or I go weeks without channeling or opening up to those realms, I do get sicker. And so I just feel depleted. I feel lack of energy. I don't feel as inspired because I can get really caught up with everything else that I do Mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur, with a podcast, interviewing people. But when I'm actually my happiest is when I'm at home (laughs) channeling, meditating, connecting with this community one-on-one and that's what makes me really happy. So I do foresee more of that in the future. Do you have any questions? Yeah, I have, I have, I have quite a few. When you mentioned the um, the plant medicine. I'm uh-huh. very fascinated by it. Monica and I have not yet. Uh, we're open, you know, so we're over. Amazing. We're always open. But, but I, do you mind maybe sharing one story or one oh, yeah. if it's an epiphany or an experience that you had that was Definitely. transformative? I think the most transformative experience that I've had was with ayahuasca. And I love that you're asking me about this now because this morning I told Jonathan, my husband, who you guys know, I'm like, I feel like I had ayahuasca this morning, (laughs) which not at all, but it can become reawakened in your system. And I think with the full moon and Libra, all these things that I'm feeling very emotional, it it reawakened some memories. And I had a very emotional morning, but it was so necessary and it was so beautiful. And um, I think really with ayahuasca, I've done it probably about 10 times um, between 2018 and before I had my son. So 2021. And oh my gosh, it reminded me of who I am, why I'm here. I realized, and I always believed in eternal souls, and we've been here many times. I always felt like an old soul. This was confirmation. I was realizing I am. This is why I feel so old, because I am. And that's a beautiful thing to embrace and to not feel like I'm, so I'm 33. So many of my friends, they're going out, they're drinking, they're single. That is not my life. (sighs) Um, And to really... (laughs) love myself for who I am instead of, I was always comparing myself. Why am I so different than a lot of people? Or I guess what would be considered normal, socially normal. And that was such an awakening. And then. So in, so did you see, or was it an ex, a feeling experience or you had vision? Oh, vision full as well. visuals. Full vision. I was not here. Like in my, not in my body. Didn't remember that I had a body absolutely in another realm. And that's the place that makes me really happy. So ayahuasca, psilocybin, ketamine therapy with therapists, I've done all of the above and all of them have given me visions, taught me so much, shown me answers to questions. I went into ayahuasca asking, why am I sick? Why did I get Lyme? I know I believe that everything happens for a reason. And that's when I was shown the ancestral stuff and how I chose to come to this lifetime, be a pattern breaker for the lineage on both sides. And so all of my ancestors were behind me, cheering me on. And it was beautiful, but I also had to feel their pain. And that's why you chose that Um, that disease? So that's kind of how it manifested in me, like the pain, all like Mm. I chose to come here and transmute their pain. And they showed me, my ancestors showed me, it's transmuting through this physical illness. That's what your physical vessel chose to experience in this lifetime to carry the pain, transmute the pain, heal the pain. Because really, if I hadn't have gotten sick, I wouldn't have slowed down. I wouldn't have gone on all these journeys and I would have just kept going and just trying to be like everybody else, I think. so interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you fear death? No. Do you think it's because of these different experiences you've had? Or did you never fear death? I think as a child, I definitely feared death. Um, I think maybe ever since ayahuasca, I don't. 
And I just see, I believe how our souls live on. And I believe we'll be with our loved ones in whatever form. And that's something Jonathan's terrified of. Has he? I was yeah, that was my other question too. <laughs> has he done it? Has Have he you done any together or yeah, has he done so any alone? I did it myself for the first time, just me with a t- bunch of strangers in Santa Cruz. And before we got married, I said, you have to do this with me. Um, I changed <laughs> me so profoundly. <laughs> and if you don't see what I have seen, or at least in your own way, it's going to be hard. So he's pretty much up for anything. He didn't even really know how intense ayahuasca is. Um, oh, he did do research. I would have I liked that. Uh, like he did a of bit of research, before. but he... I don't think Jonathan knew what he was in for. He's yeah. like, you have to, this is a prerequisite for our, our marriage. Jonathan never knew what he was in for. He didn't know what Lyme disease was, but he's like, cool, totally not a big deal. Like we thought this, but he never knew any. And he just learned as he went along. Um, and he's had profound experiences with ayahuasca. I think he's sat with ayahuasca about four times. Um, he even went recently and I, I haven't felt called since becoming a mother just yet. Um, but he went recently and it's so healing for him in a different way. I was surprised, but it taught me a lot that he didn't see anything that I had seen or have the same experience as me, which is true about that medicine. Everyone's experience is going to be so different. Um, But he's had, it's just healing in his own way. He can handle a lot of medicine and I just need a little bit of this plant medicine. I'm very sensitive. Mm -hmm. He can handle so much and he can still run around and play in nature and he's taking pictures of things and he's laughing and I'm having like hysterical (laughs) exorcisms on the floor, but we're so different in that way. And that's what my soul chose. And he's like a puppy soul, but he's an old soul too. That is so cute. Mm -hmm. I love that. No, so, I, I kind of picture us. You'd probably be running and frolicking. Yeah, I feel like yeah. that, this yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's why I'm like resistant. I know. I think that. Um, yeah, I just relate so much to to you and and your experiences. We it's it feels similar. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So we're going to ask uh, anything we can uh, share with our listeners about where they can go to where learn. they can follow you. So, what you is yes. there anything? What you're working on next, or just any message at all? Yes. So you can find. me. Yeah, on the balance bond on Instagram, very active on Instagram and the balance bond.com. I still blog way back to the blogging days of 12 years ago. I blog every week. Um, I'm writing a new book and it'll probably be out. It'll be a while. You know how the book process yeah. goes, but it's, it's the healing journey and it's all about how we're our own healers. And then right now I'm putting a lot of energy into the meditation platform that I mentioned. It's a membership called the Balance Wand Soul on Fire. And that's where you can listen to channelings. There's hundreds of meditations in there, affirmations for living a healthy life, Um, like pep talks on how to channel and spiritually awaken, all that good stuff. So that's very fun. People can find that just through my website. Amazing. That's mm-hmm. I'm going to check that out too. Yeah, that sounds great. I'm going to send it to you guys. Yes. Well, this thank was you. So fun. This so was nice. Love. A wonderful conversation. You guys are amazing. Thank you for thank sharing you. your energy and your light with us. And stay spiritually hungry. Yes. Such a good name. <laughs>